Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matt from Mass Bookshelf and today we are finally at the Ulysses destination. I had the book right here. I survived my trek into the Irish wilderness to retrieve Ulysses by James Joyce. It has been a two to three month journey to get to this point. I think I had the idea about three months ago actually and yeah, we're finally here with Ulysses. But the best part is I haven't even finished Ulysses yet, so there'll still be plenty of videos and plenty of more losing my mind over this book to do. So as I said in my previous video, my Dubliner slash Ulysses read-along announcement video, that these first few videos on Ulysses, as I'm reading them, will be somewhat informal. I'm just going to give my general thoughts on the book, as well as some analysis later on in the video. So with that said, we waited long enough to get to Ulysses. Let's dive into it. As the video will suggest, I am, you know, about a third of the way through the book, a little over a third of the way through the book right now. And man, even though I've spent hours and hours and hours reading Joyce and preparing for Ulysses, I still find myself quite unprepared for the book. And that's to be expected. I've heard that you do not really understand the full breadth of the book until you've read it multiple times. And especially the first read is going to be the most difficult, and I can definitely feel that first two chapters, which follow Stephen Dedalus, kind of trick you into thinking it's going to be a real book, but very soon it gets weird. It gets into Joyce's uh, train of thought, train of consciousness, writing style, and he gives you a little hints of it in Portrait and in Giacomo and Joyce, but nothing really prepares you for the real thing like what you have here. There are so many pages of, especially Stephen Dedalus, who is the Joyce character, the, the Joyce uh, Stanton character, just thinking and thinking and making all these references to literature, to to um, religious um, events or characters. And it all makes sense in a way because Stephen Dedalus uh, at this point is a poet and a literary professor in, or a literary teacher in Dublin. For a little bit of a background in Portrait, he, at the end of Portrait, he fled from Ireland to Italy because he thought that Ireland was uh, restricting him from a creative standpoint, he felt that through due to the Irish nationalism and religious fanaticism that was going on in Ireland, that he would never be able to achieve the full breadth of his artistic abilities unless he actually fled the country. And so he did flee and now is coming back to Ireland. He's now living in Dublin again. This having, you know, some filled his goals to become an artist, but also, you know, finding himself coming back to Ireland. So there's a cyclical nature to Ulysses and Portrait of the Artist. And I've heard that through videos and research that I've done that the book Ulysses is very much about the cycle of time, the cyclical nature of time, I should say. Time is a flat circle, as well as uh, usurpation. So I mean, look, being on the lookout for those themes throughout the book. And with Stephen, going back to Stephen in the first couple of chapters, you have a very different Stephen, somewhat different Stephen from the ending of Portrait. And the ending of Portrait, he's somewhat revitalized. He goes through various stages of depression in Portrait, but... By the end of it, he, you know, feels like he finally has his calling and he, he finally is, you know, willing to achieve his artistic pursuits. You know, think of that moment in Houth where he's on the beach and this, like, magical woman appears to him and it, like, gives him the epiphany to actually leave the country and then she disappears. So I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that she's a magical, she's the magical embodiment of Irish uh, creativity or something. I don't know. I'm making that up. But that's kind of how I saw it. You see him now with his friend Buck Mulligan, who is a medical student, and he's back to being sad again, and there's a good reason for it, and that is because his mother has died, but because of his anti-religious beliefs, he did not go and visit her, which parallels Exiles. That is Richard's problem at the beginning of the play, when Beatrice Justice comes to visit him, and he announces that his mother has died, but he did not go visit her because they are on bad terms, and that is something that sticks with him. So already parallels between Richard and Stephen Dedalus, and it probably has something to do with Joyce as well, because both Richard and Stephen Dedalus are, you know, very much stand-ins. They're, they're writers, they're Irish writers who flee the country to Italy. They're very much Joyce at the same time, so you can very much imagine that Joyce went through very similar thoughts and feelings. In fact, earlier on in Ulysses, Stephen says, History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. And that line could possibly relate to his own past with some of the mistakes he's made. Maybe he's feeling guilty about having fled the country, having fled his parents, having somewhat abandoned his parents, but also Irish history as well. As you know, was you know, demonstrated time over again in Portrait, he's very much against the societal 
evolution that Ireland is taking, or lack thereof, the evolution maybe that Ireland is taking at the time. He's very much a cynical man at this point, and hopefully, because I don't know what happens in Ulysses, hopefully that changes because, you know, I really like the character Stephen Dedalus. And then you have Harold Bloom, who... <laughs> then you have Leopold Bloom, who is making his first appearance in the, the Joyceverse, if you will. Funnily enough, I mentioned in my Giacomo Joyce video that Leopold Bloom is probably inspired by a real-life historical person named Leopoldo Bloom, who is the father of an Italian student that Joyce had an affair with while he was teaching English in Trieste. So, Peril is there. They're both Jewish as well. And you first see Harold, Harold Bloom. Not Harold Bloom. I'm probably going to call him Harold Bloom, but Leopold the Bloom. You, see, you have Harold... You have Leopold Bloom in his first scene, you know, chowing down on some, like, liver and organs, and he's a cook, and he, you know, is eating meat and, you know, the organs of animals and whatever, and he's supposed to parallel Odysseus. So this is the very first paragraph of mentioning Leopold Bloom. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hen cods rose. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. So obviously very uh, disgusting sort of description there, at least from my perspective. It's supposed to somewhat demonstrate the fact that he's gluttonous, I would imagine. But when you think of comparing Bloom to Odysseus, the first scene of the first scene of the Odyssey with Odysseus in it is when he's stranded on the island of Calypso after all of his crew is dead. And very importantly, him and Calypso are in a sexual relationship. Perhaps Joyce is making a very sick parallel here where whereas Odysseus is having a relationship, is like, you know, having a lustful relationship with a goddess, Bloom is having a lustful relationship with his food. And you'll see over and over again when he's at like a market later on, like he just is, he goes in these huge descriptive details of raw meat and you know organs and just you know meat in general because he's a cook and i mean i guess he's a good cook too but i don't really know it doesn't really sound that appealing from the paragraph that was just described but he's a very gluttonous man so i'm wondering if there's supposed to be some sort of parallel between like lust for flesh like lust for lust for flesh in a sexual way and lust for flesh in like a hungry way in a gluttonous way like you see with bloom here so Perhaps Calypso in the Ulysses is just a bunch, is just like a bunch of livers and kidneys and organs from, you know, dead animals. So take that what you will. I'm probably completely wrong about that there, but, you know, we'll see. So I'm going to state the, the obvious Odyssey parallels here. Stephen Dedalus is Telemachus because he starts the story of Ulysses just as Telemachus starts the story of the Odyssey. Bloom is Odysseus and Molly is very likely, well, certainly Penelope. She's probably a combination of a couple characters because unlike the Odyssey, Odysseus and Penelope don't meet until the end, whereas Harold Bloom, <laughs> Leopold Bloom sees, is with Molly at the beginning, and also very interesting, he is made reference to another uh, character in the Odyssey. So in this scene, Bloom and Molly are in their bedroom and talking, and you get the first hints that Bloom may be untrustworthy to Molly, and as he's with her, while he's cooking dinner, while he's cooking food for her, he says, The battle of the nymphs over the bed, given away with the eastern number of photo bits, splendid masterpiece in art colors, tea before you put milk in, not unlike her, with her hair down, slimmer, three and six I gave for the frame. She said it would look nice over the bed, naked nymphs, grease, and for the instance, all the people that lived then. So Molly apparently is a nymph as well. If you don't know what a nymph is, it is, you know, this like beautiful mermaid creature that lures sailors, male sailors, into like, their caves or whatever and kills them. You'll see them in the Odyssey because in order to get home, Odysseus and his crew have to go through like this nymph colony. And if the men hear their songs, they'll be lured in and then killed and drowned. They'll be drowned and killed. So Odysseus makes the men cover their ears, but also leaves his is uncovered, but ties himself up to the boat so he can hear their music. And it completely seduces him, but, and he would go to the nymphs had he not been tied to the boat, and that's what allows him to survive that, and his, and his men looking out for him. So you have Molly luring men to her house, probably, not to kill them, I would imagine, but from 
Leopold Bloom's perspective, he is this beautiful figure that is also secretly very dangerous. So you already know from the get-go that Bloom is very untrustworthy towards his wife. Which is a very interesting comparison because Penelope is the, like, the, at least from, like, the Greek standpoint, like, the ideal, like, loyal wife to Odysseus. She's, you know, tempted by the suitors that are living in their palace in Ithaca, but for years she remains loyal to Odysseus, whereas Odysseus does not remain loyal to her in many ways, as him having sex with Calypso would prove. But, he, again, he's also loyal in a way because he wants to get back to her as well. But she's, like, she refuses to have relations with another man, whereas Molly is, like, the antithesis of that in a way. She's having affairs. She is both the wife of Odysseus, but also the nymph that, you know, lures people and is deceptive. And very interesting, you know, dichotomy there. And I want to, you know, I'm interested in seeing where it goes further and considering that i'm i don't want to sound like i'm just blaming molly like she's like the, the villain of the story because bloom as you'll see has a lot of character flaws he's a very a lot he's a lot of psychological damage but also some character flaws as well where it seems that he's more infatuated with food than he is his own wife so take that as you will i you know i want to see where her character goes and, and you know what eventually comes a bit towards the end of the book so just to go a little more into Bloom's character, he has a daughter named Millie, I believe, who is currently away from Dublin. He's, she's in another area of Ireland he's studying uh, for university, and he misses her dearly, and they write to each other. It seems like they have a healthy relationship there. And he had a son, from what I can tell, that died early, and that has sort of been something that has haunted him since then. And it further explains his obsession with death that is demonstrated in this passage. The gates glimmered in front, still open, back to the world again. Enough of this place. Brings you a bit nearer every time. Last time I was here was Mrs. Sinico's funeral. Poor Papa, too. The love that kills. And even scraping up the air at night with a lantern, like that case I read of to get at fresh buried females, or even putrefied with running grave sores. Give you the creeps after a bit. I will appear to you after death. You will see my ghost after death. My ghost will haunt you after death. There is another world after death named Hell. I do not like that other world she wrote. No more do I. Plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Feel life warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They are not going to get me this innings. Warm beds, warm, full-blooded life. <laughs> it's very interesting that he completely ne neglects the existence of heaven. So here, so, here, Leopold Bloom is... Jewish, and you'll see later on that there's a lot of anti-Semitism in Ireland and in Dublin at this time, especially when Bloom is not around and everyone thinks it's okay to start, you know, saying anti-Semitic things. So perhaps that has something to do with this faith, but to be so pessimistic of there is one place after death and that is hell, and describing maggoty beds and everything, you know, it really shows that Bloom has a very sore opinion on what happens after death. You can probably, you know, extrapolate from that that he's depressed and that the death of his son, I think, um, is, you know, really having a profound impact on him because from probably what he believes, the son is in hell, and that's not a very good thing. But if I'm wrong, you know, correct me on that as well. As Ulysses goes on, as far as I've read, Stephen Dedalus has a conversation with the students about Shakespeare and Hamlet, which I will not particularly attempt to uh, describe in detail right now because I need to go through it again. I need to reread Hamlet as well. But Mark, if you want to do a video on Hamlet and Ulysses, let me know because I'd be glad to do that with you. That'd be a very fun video, actually, because Joyce has very complex feelings on Shakespeare and on Hamlet and how how much Hamlet affects his, affected Shakespeare's real life. And I'll have, to, I'll have to admit that as Ulysses has gone on, it has gone more difficult. As I said, the first two chapters kind of trick into thinking it's a real book and then it becomes insane nightmare. But from what I've attempted to extrapolate, this is what I've gotten from it. And later on, Bloom goes to a pub with his friends. And, but also there's a man named Asphism who is this, you know, huge like Irishman and I think he's supposed to I from but I when I first read it I thought he's supposed to parallel um the Cyclops in the Odyssey but um I was corrected and to, and then now know that it is supposed to be Hades so maybe he is a standing for Achilles or one of the ancient Greek heroes that died during Troy or after Troy but I'm gonna show you the description of the citizen like this big imposing Irishman just so you get the <laughs> the extent of how crazy Joyce Zapras is so this takes place when Bloom enters the pub and sees the citizen for the first time. 
The figure seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower was that of a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-lived, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bark-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruddy-faced, <laughs> sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder, he measured several L's, and his rock-like mountainous knees were covered, as was likewise the rest of his body wherever visible, with a strong growth of tawny, prickly hair in hue and toughness, similar to the mountain gorse Ulex Europius, the wide-winged nostrils from which bristles of the same tawny hue projected were of such capaciousness that within their cavernous obscurity the field lark might easily have lodged her nest. The eyes in which a tear and a smile strove ever for the mastery were of the dimensions of a good-sized cauliflower. A powerful current of warm breath issued a regular interval from the profound cavity of his mouth, while the rhythmic resonance, the loud, strong hail reverberations of his formidable heart thundered rumblingly, causing the ground, the summit of the lofty tower, and still loftier walls of the cave to vibrate and tremble. He wore a long, unsleeved garment of recently flayed oxhide, reaching to the knees in a loose kilt, and this was bound about his middle by a girdle of plaited straw and rushes. Beneath this he wore trues of deerskin, roughly stitched with gut. His nether extremities were encased in high, ballbriggan buskins dyed in lich and purple, the feel being shod in brogues of salted cowhide laced with the windpipe of the same beast. From his girdle hung a row of sea stones which dangled at every moment of his portentous frame, and on these were graven in rude yet striking art the tribal image of many Irish heroes and heroines of antiquity, Cuchulain Khan of Hundred Battles, Niall of Nine Hostages, Brian of Kinkara, the Ardry Malachi, Art McMurrug, and then goes on to his name a bunch of names that I have no idea who most of them are. And that's the beauty of Ulysses, is that there's a lot of listing and a lot of references to things that I do not quite understand. But interestingly enough, the citizen is very much portrayed in a very bestial form, and I don't think it should also be ignored that throughout the conversation that Bloom has with the other people in the pub, that being his friend Joe, the citizen, and some other, you know, bartenders. The citizen is a is like a staunch Irish nationalist. He um, gets in an argument with Bloom about Irish nationalism, and I'm wondering if there, there's sort of like a uh, you know a correlation between this bestial figure and Irish nationalism that Joyce is trying to draw here. He's very intelligent. He's a very intelligent man, despite like the description you think he'd be like, like a brutish person. But also at the same time, he is very unflinching in his nationalistic ideals, and he believes that like a lot of the Irish people here, when they start discussing Irish nationalism and what defines an Irish person, he, he parallels the Israel twelve tribes. The, the, 12 tribes of, the 12 tribes of Israel, I should say, as saying that only the descendants of these Celtic Irish, like pre-Saxon uh, invasion, are like the true Irish people. Whereas Bloom, on the other hand, who is Jewish, who does not have the same Irish roots as the citizen, believes that anyone who is born in Ireland and lives in Ireland is Irish. So you have the inclusivity of Bloom, you know, counterposed with the staunch, you have to be a specific bloodline to be truly Irish uh, thoughts of the citizen. I do like the parallel between the 12 tribes of Israel and what the citizen thinks is the, um, the true Irish person. Hell, later on, it's somewhat ironic that once Bloom leaves, everyone becomes anti-Semitic and starts making fun of him for his faith. And so on one hand, the citizen values, somewhat finds value in the 12 tribes of Israel and how it defines like a true person from a, nation, from a nationality. But at the same time, he's pro-Irish and doesn't really view Bloom as being a true Irish person because... Despite the fact that he's lived his whole life in Ireland, he's not from the true Irish descent. So the whole chapter in the pub is fascinating, and it gets really into that portion of the Irish as young man territory where it discusses like what Irish nationalism is. And there's war. There are people discussing. They discuss going to war with Britain to secede. There's discussing of Gaelic sports, which I watched when I was doing my semester abroad in Dublin. I watched the Gaelic football final, which Dublin won, and he compares the Gaelic sports to what the Greek. Uh, it's what the Greeks did, you know, during, during ancient Greece time with their own sports and how it's like a true demonstration of, you know, like the, like the Olympian, like the ideal Olympian. So all that is really interesting there. 
and you can tell that's that's where Joyce is at his most comfortable thematically wise with in his writing. So as this video is coming to an end, I just want to read a couple of uh, chapters and sections that I like from Ulysses and go a little bit in depth into them. So the first image or symbolism that I found to be potentially interesting is this one in uh, page six, which is a Stephen Douglas chapter. It is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Obviously, this has a very, uh, you know, this is a very soft spot for Joyce um, art being an artist in Ireland. He describes it as being the a, a crooked looking glass. And I don't particularly know what that means yet, but I found that, that image to be kind of funny. It's obviously that it's broken that, you know, art in Ireland are not going, are not court, like there's an attempt at being helpful, but it's not fully realized it's broken. So that's like the obvious thing to take away from it. But it comes up again later on in Ulysses. So I'm looking out for that imagery more and more as I keep reading it. And the next section is from my Harold Bloom chapter. Here's a passage that I don't particularly know the significance of, but I just like the way that it's written. Tell her a ghost story in bed to make her sleep. Have you ever seen a ghost? Well, I have. It was a pitch dark night. The clock was on the stroke of 12. Still, they'd kiss all right if properly keyed up. Horrors in Turkish graveyards. Learn anything if taken young. You might pick up a young widow here. Men like that. Love among the tombstones. Romeo, spice of pleasure. In the midst of death, we are in light. Both ends meet, tantalizing for the poor dead. Smell of frilled beefsteaks to the starving gnawing their vitals. Desire to grig people. Molly wanted to do it at the window. Eight children he has anyway. So in this section where Stephen Dedalus is talking with the students and is making his argument for how Hamlet is based on Shakespeare's real life and real like encounters and real familial relationships, uh, Stephen makes this comparison between the artist and his, you know, real world encounters. As we, or Mother Dana, weave and unweave our bodies, Stephen said, from day to day, their molecules shuttled to and fro, so does the artist weave and unweave his image. And as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, though all my body has been woven of new stuff time after time, so through the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth in the intense instant of imagination when the mind, Shelley says, is a fading coal, that which I was is that which I am, and that which in possibility I may come to be. So in the future, the sister of the past, I may see myself as I sit here now, but my reflection from that which then shall be. And that is when he's talking about Shakespeare potentially in relationship to Hamlet being the father of Hamlet because his son who died in infancy was named Hamnet. So in this uh, passage, Stephen Dedalus is arguing that Dedalus is technically Hamlet's father in the play Hamlet and his mother is Shakespeare's real life wife, Anne Hathaway. And it, and it touches on the nature of art in general, whereas artists are gonna constantly draw from their real world experiences. So to end this episode on an immature note, this uh, passage takes place in the pub, which I mentioned earlier, which is Hades, where it, news is revealed that a person is hanged by uh, British authorities. And one of the characters mentions that the character, that the person who was hanged uh, had an eruption when he died. And in this passage, Bloom explains how, explains, this explains scientifically how that is possible. So I'll read that. There's one thing it has an a deterrent effect on, says Alf. What's that, says Joe. The poor bugger's tool. That's being hanged, says Alf. That's so, says Joe. God's truth, says Alf. I heard that from the head warder that was in Kilmaham when they hanged Joe Brady, the Invincible. He told me that they cut him down after the drop. It was standing up in their faces like a poker. Ruling passion strong in death, says Joe, as someone said. That can be explained by science, says Bloom. It's only a natural phenomenon, don't you see? Because on account of the... And then he starts with his jawbreakers about phenomenon and science and the phenomenon of other phenomenon. The distinguished scientist, Herr Professor Leutpold Blumendorf, <laughs> tendered medical evidence to the effect that the instantaneous fracture of the cervical vertebrae and the consequent scission of the spinal cord would, according to the best approved traditions of medical science, be calculated to the inevitable produce in the human subject a violent ganglionic stimulus of the nerve centers, causing the pores of the corpora cavernosa 
to rapidly dilate in such a way as to instantaneously facilitate the flow of blood to that part of the human anatomy known as the penis or male organ resulting in the phenomenon which has been dominated by the faculty a morbid upwards and outwards philoprogenitive erection in articulo mortis per diminutinonum capitis. So yeah, Harold Bloom's obviously very intelligent and I really enjoy how the section is written because you have Bloom starting to talk but then the narrator takes over and then calls him heir uh, Leutpold Blumenduft, which is, you know, just you know, make reference to like him being a, a German uh, scientist or something and explaining this and I can imagine that did not go over particularly well in the in the bar scene. So yeah, book isn't all depressing. So I hope you enjoyed my first episode of Talking Ulysses. I hope this is what you were expecting because this is very informal and I apologize for that, but this book is fascinating and I just want to get my raw thoughts out on it as I'm reading it so that, you know, as time goes on, that can change and see, you know, how I progress throughout reading the book and potentially rereading the book too at some point, not anytime soon, but at some point. And with that said, you know, this is a commutative uh, project. So if you're reading Ulysses with me, I'd love to hear what you think of the book so far. And you can expect another uh, installment of this video of the series probably in the next few weeks or so, depending on how quickly I read it. But I'm, you know, I'm trying to read this relatively quickly. It's crazy that I'm almost halfway-ish done with the book and, you know, I'm enjoying it. It's very difficult and at sometimes I finish a session of reading and I just like, you know, I feel mentally exhausted because I'm trying to understand what's going on, but there are times where it is extremely difficult to fully understand what Joyce is trying to say in the prose because it's a train of thought and it's a train of consciousness and these characters are very intelligent, but also, you know, somewhat crazy at the same time. And that reflects it here in the prose. He does a very great job with that. But when you do understand what's going on, it's very rewarding. And, you, and like for me personally, I feel very, you know, I feel a great sense of pride as the book is going on and I'm starting to understand more what's going on because I'm getting more adjusted to what Joyce is trying to do here. So yes, again, I implore you to tell me what you think about Ulysses so far if you're reading along with me because I'm not claiming to be an expert on this. And if I'm wrong about anything that I'm saying, you know, please correct me because I want to be corrected on this stuff. I want to be able to understand this book as well as I possibly can. And yeah, thank you. Uh, if you're if you're just coming across this this video or my channel, you know, I recommend checking out my other videos, especially my Word Lucy stuff, because a lot of that took a lot of work and a lot of time, and I very much enjoyed it. And I think it'll be very helpful for you to understand what's going on in this book, at least somewhat, because even with the amount of Ulysses that I've read, I still find this book to be extremely difficult. And check out my friends, Colorless Wonderland and Dronzo. If Dronzo is still out there, we'll see. I don't know. I haven't heard from him for like months. No, that's not true. I, he's still, I just hung out with him, so it's fine. And he's just not making YouTube videos anymore. And check out Film Frauds as well, because there's a lot of good stuff there too. And check out my own videos and my Instagram, which I will link in the description below. Yes, so thank you, and I will see you hopefully in the next Ulysses installment, and goodbye.